Um, my name is Jessica Culverhouse. I'll be hosting the webinar this evening, um, Biomimicry Designing by Nature. Just a few notes before we get started. Um, I've mentioned to those of you who've been on the call for a few minutes. You're being muted as you enter the webinar just to eliminate some background noise, but rest assured you'll be able to hear the presenters. We just won't be able to hear you. This is the first webinar in our series leading up to National Environmental Education Week 2014. EE Week um, next April will be held April 13th through 19th, and it's being sponsored by Samsung. As part of our multi-year Green STEM initiative, EE Week 2014's annual theme will be Engineering a Sustainable World. And with this theme, we'll be providing resources for educators on opportunities to engage students in learning about the environment and sustainability through engineering and design. We're really excited to be kicking off our webinar series with biomimicry, um, focusing in on designing by nature. A few housekeeping items before we begin the webinar. Um, once again, you're being muted um, as you enter the webinar. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use the chat feature that you see on the right side of your screen, your WebEx screen. If you look under Send To, there's a drop-down menu there. And if you have a question for a presenter, send your question to Ask a Question. If you'd like to go ahead and look at that chat feature now, um, you can look for Ask a Question. Between um, our presentations, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A with our presenters. And during that time, your questions will be asked to the presenters, um, those questions that you send to ask a question. If the slides appear to be too large or too small for you, feel free to adjust the size um, using the zoom percentage in the bottom left side of your WebEx screen. That might help you be able to see the slides better um, as the webinar progresses. Tonight's webinar will, will introduce the fascinating topic of biomimicry and share some opportunities for learning through the exploration of biomimicry. Um, I have a brief agenda on the screen for you here so that you can see how things will work tonight. Our first presentation will be made um, by Sam Steer of Learning with Nature in Missoula, Montana. We'll then have some time for Q&A with Sam. And his Q&A will be followed by a presentation on opportunities and strategies for teaching with biomimicry, presented by Jenny Stern of Sunnyside Environmental School in Portland, Oregon. We'll then hear a little bit from one of our partners for this webinar, the Biomimicry Education Network, um, to learn more about some opportunities for teacher training and curriculum relating to biomimicry. So at this time, I'm going to turn things over to Sam. Sam Steer is the Director of Learning with Nature, a nonprofit organization devoted to teacher training and curriculum development that connects nature to STEM education and sustainability learning. Before founding Learning with Nature, Sam was a National Science Foundation Fellow and directed the Youth, or youth Education Program at Biomimicry 3.8, founded by Janine Benyus. Sam is currently a professor of sustainable design at Otis College and lives in Montana with his wife, two sons, cats, chickens, guinea pig, and hamster. So if you give me a minute, Sam, I'll turn the presentation over to you and we will get started. There. Okay, Sam, take it away. Okay, hi everyone out there. Thanks for joining the webinar. I'm Sam Steyer, Director of Learning with Nature, and it's a real pleasure to be speaking with you today about innovation inspired by nature, or biomimicry. As a curriculum developer and teacher trainer, biomimicry is a rich source of inspiration for me for new approaches to curricula and pedagogy. And as an ecologist and parent interested in sustainability, I found the topic important and simply fascinating. Biomimicry offers a great deal for STEM educators, so let's get to it. Since this is an introduction to biomimicry, I'm going to assume everyone listening is only slightly familiar with the topic, even though I'm sure there's a wide range of familiarity amongst you. So first, how do we define biomimicry? What exactly are we talking about here? Someone once told me they overheard a conversation at a dinner party where someone said this. Biomimicry is a very new term. 
The modern use of the term comes from author Janine Benyus, who combined the Latin words bios, meaning life, with mimesis, meaning to emulate. Here's how she described it. The core idea is that nature, imaginative by necessity, has already solved many of the problems we are grappling with. Animals, plants, and microbes are the consummate engineers. They have found what works, what is appropriate, and most important, what lasts here on Earth. The conscious emulation of life's genius is a survival strategy for the human race, a path to a sustainable future. The more our world functions like the natural world, the more likely we are to endure on this home that is ours, but not ours alone. In other words, nature and technology are partners. Biomimicry begins with the realization that nature offers us opportunities for shaping our technological world and future. And biomimicry is that practice of abstracting good design from nature. It's helpful to be aware of other related terms, such as biomimetics, bioinspired design, bionics, and others. They all mean innovation inspired by nature. Biomimicry sometimes has a greater emphasis on innovation that relates specifically to sustainability. So biomimicry is sometimes thought of as a subset of biomimetics. For most purposes and situations, however, any of these terms are fine. It's also important to understand what biomimicry is not. The most common misunderstanding of biomimicry is to think it is the same as biomorphism. Something biomimetic does not need to look like the thing in nature that inspired it, and frequently doesn't. A car that looks like a cheetah, for instance, but isn't any faster due to its design, is not biomimetic, it's just biomorphic. Biomimicry involves a functional idea from nature that results in an improvement in how well something works. Okay, so biomimicry, though a fairly new term, is actually part of a much older idea. It's believed, for example, that over a thousand years ago, Polynesians facing navigational challenges discovered specks of land across the vast Pacific Ocean, in part by following the bearings that seagoing birds took across the open seas. Learning from birds like Pacific golden plovers where landfall was likely. Learning from nature is still common in many indigenous cultures throughout the world today. In Western cultures, there are people like Leonardo da Vinci, who looked to the natural world for aeronautical ideas. Many famous inventors did this, including the Wright brothers and Thomas Edison. And biomimetic technologies are more prevalent in our modern world than we commonly appreciate. You're hearing me right now as the result of innovation inspired by nature. The speaker inside your telephone and computer were inspired by the tympanic membrane and middle ear. Which Alexander Bell and others studied that led to the acoustic diaphragm enabling your speakers to work right now. So you're hearing my voice because of nature-inspired innovation from the 1800s. What's new today is how widespread and established biomimicry has become in innovation. Biomimetics occurs today in fields as diverse as automotive engineering, architecture, urban planning, product design, chemistry, healthcare, graphic design, organizational development, and much more. It has joined the standard ways that people design things. And its potential role in enriching STEM education is, of course, also something new. Now, the best way to get a feel for what biomimicry is, is through examples. So let's take a look at some contemporary examples, and let's start with something deceptively simple. A spider web. What you're looking at is a spider's version of a bulletproof vest. This one is designed to catch flies instead of bullets, but ounce for ounce, it is indeed as strong as a bulletproof vest. Even more astonishing, it's made out of the digested flies it catches. It's also extremely material efficient. A pound or so of spider silk contains enough thread to encircle the entire earth. We pass over them every day, but they're an engineering marvel and a very high-tech material. Another interesting thing about spider webs is that birds rarely collide into them. If you've ever walked into a web, you can empathize. And it makes sense for spiders to want to help birds avoid destroying their webs. So how do these two very different species communicate? Spiders do it by using a light we can't see, but which birds can see very well. When you shine an ultraviolet light on a spider web, it lights up like a Christmas tree, and that's what birds see. Unfortunately, birds don't do so well when it comes to seeing our structures. Millions of birds perish every year by colliding into building glass they cannot see. 
So what if you did this? Put a coating of UV reflecting threads onto architectural glass. That's in fact what a major glass manufacturer called Arno Glass has started to do. And the result in buildings like this one in Germany is that the number of bird collisions drop by about 75%. This is an example of innovation inspired by nature. In this case, a trick we learned from spiders. Here's another example. This is Staphylococcus aureus bacteria, the SA in MRSA, when it becomes pathogenic and resistant to methicillin. If you bump into this guy while in a hospital, it can be a big problem. This is a plastic film used in hospital settings that stops the spread of bacteria. Now, normally we use harsh chemical antibiotics to kill bacteria in hospitals, but there are problems with this biocidal approach. The bacteria can become resistant, and the chemicals themselves contaminate water downstream of factories and hospital settings. This plastic film uses texture to fight bacteria instead of chemicals. You can see the texture under a microscope in the top row. Compared to the spread of staph on the smooth control surface on the bottom row, you can see the textured surface is much more effective and no chemicals are required. The idea and design of the texture comes from studying shark skin, which under a microscope looks like this. This design has helped sharks avoid bacteria without chemicals and without creating antibiotic resistance for 450 million years. And now, thanks to innovation inspired by nature, it's helping humans too. Many examples of biomimicry have to do with the design of what we make. Many other examples of biomimicry have to do with how we make them. Concrete, for instance, is a material humans use a lot of. And this is how we make it. First, we mine the precursor material, limestone, from the Earth's crust to the tune of about 39 billion tons per year. Then, we cook the limestone at 1500 degrees Celsius in order to change its crystalline structure so that it becomes reactive with water. That's the gray powdered stuff you buy at the hardware store. Now, that cooking process creates 6% of our annual greenhouse gas emissions, one of the largest single point causes of climate change. And this is another impact on the environment from how we make cement. Now, this is the environmental result of how a different organism makes cement. The stony corals have been manufacturing calcium carbonate for about 240 million years, but they do it in a very different way than us. Corals extract the calcium and carbon and oxygen atoms from the surrounding seawater and precipitate the calcium carbonate molecule at ambient ocean temperatures by manipulating pH, which means they don't need to mine the Earth's crust and they don't need to cook anything up using fossil fuels. No quarries, no greenhouse gases. In fact, corals actually clean the air in the process of building their cement, in addition to providing a beautiful and important habitat for other species. What if we made cement in a similar way? Well, this company in California, Calera, has done it. By bubbling calcium-rich seawater through the carbon-rich flue stacks of power plants, powdered limestone precipitates out, tons of it. No quarries, no greenhouse gases, learn from the coral reef. So that's biomimicry. If it's biological, it can inspire technological innovation. Whether it's a biological property or behavior like UV reflectance, a physiological process like biomineralization, or a biological shape or texture like shark skin, or even an entire ecological system like nutrient cycling in a forest. There are literally hundreds of examples of biomimicry, and I could go on all day giving examples, but what I want you to take away is that if it's biological at whatever scale, it can inspire technological innovation, often quite remarkable innovation. Biomimicry applies to the design of what we make, how we make it, and how what we make fits into the world. Another way to think about biomimicry is how it changes the way we think and learn about the natural world. These are some of the ideas, for example, we traditionally convey to people about organisms, their scientific name, their geographic range, predominant economic use, and so forth, typical natural history material. 
And this is a different way of thinking and learning about the same organism. You can see biomimicry focuses not on what we can learn about organisms, but what we can learn from organisms. That's the change. Okay, so what does all this have to do with STEM education? Teachers and students already have plenty of content to cover. Why add in biomimicry? I think there are many good reasons to consider it. To begin with, you can integrate biomimicry into the STEM material you already cover, so it doesn't have to add any additional burden. And in the process, biomimicry can help make the STEM material you're covering that much more interesting and relevant to your students. Consider chemistry, for instance. Chemistry labs typically begin with reactants, sometimes hazardous, whose reaction is often facilitated by Bunsen burners. When the lab is done, the products are routinely vented into the air or poured down the drain. In other words, we teach chemistry to kids much the same way people do actual manufacturing in the real world, using hazardous chemicals, reacted with the heat of fossil fuels, and releasing the products and waste into the environment. Biomimetic chemistry explores what we could learn from the way the other 10 million plus species do chemistry, without mining, at ambient temperatures, minimizing toxins and waste. As part of a biomimetic chemistry unit we've been developing, for example, kids make cement in a lab using the same chemistry that corals and the Calera company mimicking corals use. No mining or greenhouse gas is required. The activity doesn't need expensive lab equipment and the materials can be bought from a grocery store for a few dollars. These kinds of lessons expose students to a completely different kind of chemistry, not shaped by the last 250 years since the Industrial Revolution, but by the last nearly four billion years of life. And in the process, students learn about the chemical concepts they need to know, as well as a 21st century approach to chemistry and sustainable manufacturing. So that's biomimetic chemistry. Now, these students at the Center for Science and Industry in Ohio are exploring biomimetic physics by comparing the performance of wind turbine blade shapes, one with a typical smooth leading edge, the other inspired by the serrated shape of humpback whale flippers. And these primary school students are engaged in a science experiment comparing two different greenhouse designs, one conventional and the other inspired by the fur of polar bears. So hopefully you can start to see what I mean about biomimicry providing a compelling framework for exploring many STEM topics, whether general science, biology, engineering, chemistry, physics, or math. And students like the approach because it relates nature to technology, both things they're interested in, and school to the real world. And we all know how crucial it is to connect education to the real world. Educators also like biomimicry because it's solution-oriented. It's optimistic. This is important because for the last 40 years, we've been teaching environmental education often like this, making kids aware of the problems but offering few ways out. Though well-intentioned, many educators realize this may not be the most effective approach to nurturing awareness, social responsibility, and a proactive attitude. This is how a high school science teacher put it. I'll just let you read it yourselves. Biomimicry can also be project-based, nurturing creativity and innovation, which students greatly appreciate and benefit from. This fifth grader invented a jacket, for example, based on his observation of how his cat deals with weather changes. By puffing up their fur on cold days, cats trap more warmed air next to their skin. Likewise, on cold days, you can just blow this jacket up with more air. On warmer days, you deflate it. This student developed a water collection device based on the structure of tropical bromeliads. And look how much fun he's having. The adult behind him, not so much. This team of upper elementary kids designed a bike helmet with extra protection triggered during a fall, inspired by armadillo behavior.
and this group of French high school students designed a trans-Arctic sled that doubles as a shelter, designed using morphometrics and biomechanics, inspired by the common pill bug under every garden pot. Educators also like biomimicry because it reconnects young people to nature and fosters stewardship. It's another reason nature matters. Biomimicry teaches us that nature is also a kind of brilliance. It teaches us to look for something important in nature, to discover design ingeniousness in nature. And by teaching us to pay attention to nature's designs, Biomimicry can transform what we see and how we feel when we look at the rest of life, elevating our appreciation and respect for the natural world in the process. This is potent stuff. Social theory tells us that the quickest way to change our ambitions, how we behave and what we want to be and do with our lives, is to change what we admire. Kids, of course, simply like that it's about critters while all the important stuff is happening on the inside. Educators also like that biomimicry is practical, helping prepare students for college. Over the last five years, biomimicry courses and programs have been growing rapidly throughout the colleges and, United, and universities across the United States and abroad. This is just a very small sample. This academic trend is reflected in funding for biomimetic research projects, which has been rising dramatically, especially since 2000. All of this research has an impact on product development, which you can see reflected in the patent database. The number of U.S. patents containing the term biomimetic or bioinspired in their title increased by a factor of 93 in comparison with all patents, which increased by a factor of only 2.7 over the same time period. In other words, biomimicry is a comparatively fast-growing driver of new patents and new patents get translated into biomimetic products, which are a significant driver of the economy. This table shows just a few such products in the marketplace today, which generate billions of dollars of revenue. And all of these facts and trends equate to projections of strong job growth. One economic study concluded that in 15 years, biomimicry could account for 1.6 million U.S. jobs by 2025. For students and their parents, they may simply appreciate that biomimicry may one day help them find that job. Finally, as a school topic, biomimicry is flexible and can be adapted to a variety of socioeconomic realities and personal student interests. Examples of biomimicry range from cars to cosmetics, so it's very easy to relate to different student realities and interests and make the material as engaging as possible. I think it's also fair to say that you can add why educators like biomimicry to the right-hand column as well. Not only students, but educators also like biomimicry because it's positive and fun and a whole new way to understand and explore the natural world and invigorate our STEM teaching. The educators we've trained in biomimicry work in primary, secondary, and post-secondary schools all over the world teaching a variety of subjects. In the end, the exposure can be quite transformative. Let me leave you with two quotes. The first is from a fifth grade boy and the second from a girl who recently graduated from high school. I'll let you read them to yourself. Here's the one from the fifth grader. And here's the next one. One last thing to mention before ending. Biomimicry isn't just about curricula and pedagogy for schools. Many of the technologies that are emerging from nature-inspired design can be used in the facilities and operations of a school itself and would work to make that school more energy efficient, non-toxic, and so forth. By using these technologies in schools, the school also becomes a teaching tool itself, a real-life example of what the kids are learning about in their classes, something to keep in mind if you are building or remodeling. 
So, thank you for listening. I hope it was a useful introduction, though brief, to the world of nature-inspired innovation. Please feel free to contact me with any questions you may have about curricula or teacher training, and I look forward to seeing what you will do with biomimicry and STEM education. Thank you, Sam. That was a really fantastic introduction. We really appreciate it. I'd okay. like to now open it up for questions. Um, if anyone has a question for Sam, please feel free to send it to ask a question in the chat box on the bottom right side of your WebEx screen. And my colleague Jeff will be asking your questions that you're sending to him at that name. So I'll turn it over to Jeff to start the questions with Sam. Okay, great. Thank you. <clears throat> Sam, thank you for that great introduction to biomimicry. Uh, I think a lot of us now, when we go out and walk around in nature, are going to be observing a lot more and looking for those inspirations. And I was wondering if, uh, while we wait for people to submit questions, uh, I'll start you off with a question here, asking if you think if a student or teacher or listener goes out and comes up with an idea inspired by nature for a new development or technology, what would you advise as the next step for realizing that idea or putting it into something physical? Well, I guess um, if they, it really depends what, what they want to do with it. You know, if it's um, something they really want to make, uh, pursue as a new technology in the world, um, there's, a, you know, a lot of processes in place already that help um, students or other people develop new approaches to technology. Um, you know, everything from prototyping your design, uh, and there's contests for that. In fact, the um, Biomimicry 3.8 Institute runs a student design challenge where uh, students can submit their design ideas, and then if they win, um, I believe that there's some, you know, financial reward, and then there can be some connections that can be built to, you know, further investment and so on, so that um, people can continue developing their ideas. It, it's a, it's a long process to develop a new technology, but, you know, um, it's if it's something that makes you happy and you really enjoy doing it, um, there's probably nothing else you should be doing, and the world definitely needs it. That's great. That's. Some great encouragement. Thank you. Uh, we did have some questions come in. So this one from Paulette. She says, you mentioned a chemistry curriculum designed using biomimicry labs. Is this something available for schools to adopt or purchase? Um, there's a unit that's in development right now that should be done by early next year. Um, as part of that, there are a couple labs from that unit that are available right now. Um, but, you know, it's designed as a unit, and it will be more effective um, if you deliver it as a unit. But unfortunately, it's not, not done quite yet, but we do hope that it will be done early next year. Um, one last thing to Paulette. If you're interested in that curriculum, then just send me an email so I can, you know, keep you in mind and then let you know as soon as that curriculum is ready. Great. Uh, we've got another question here from Jen Baxter. She says, how have teachers fostered creativity and ingenuity in their students? I see my student being overwhelmed and not knowing where to start. Sorry, could you just repeat the first part of that? Sure, yeah. She's asking how you get kids interested in biomimicry and foster that creativity and ingenuity and make them want to learn about it. Great, great question. You know, start with the simple things. Um, you know, take them outside and, and look at a spider web. And if you can't go outside or you can't find a spider web, bring a picture of one in, in class and, and have the kids look at it carefully and, and ask them questions about what that spider web is, is doing. What, what is it able to do that helps the spider? Why is it designed the way it is? Why is it tied this way and not another way? And have the kids, um, you know, really start to use their, their minds to think through those kind of questions. It, it, everybody has this capability, um, and you look at all the amazing innovations that have happened through biomimicry, and all of those inventors started with, with simple questions just like that. So I would suggest, you know, if you're, 
if your kids are getting frustrated, break it down, make it simpler, start with the simple questions because that's where it all starts. Great. Jessica, should we keep asking more questions now or should we move on and then come back if we have time at the end? Do you have more questions? Uh, we just got another one in here. Um, okay. Yep, this one's from Corrine Ledoux. Um, do you know what the uh, – oh, she asked, uh, are there any biomimicry institutes or organizations located around British Columbia, Canada? I don't know the answer to that offhand. Um, I would say that a good person to ask is also on this call, Gretchen Hooker, and um, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if, if there is. There's little groups of people interested in biomimicry popping up all over the place, and there certainly are other groups in the Pacific Northwest um, and possibly in Vancouver. Great. Uh, we just had another Great. one come in here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we can move on, and then I can collect them, and then if we have time at the end, we can come back to questions. Fantastic. Um, once again, everyone, feel free to send your questions to Jeff at Ask a Question. Um, if you have more questions that come up for Sam or um, questions for Ginny, who will be our next presenter. Um, thank you again, Sam. I'll um, go ahead and mute my colleagues now, um, Sam and Jeff, and reintroduce Ginny. Okay. Um, Ginny, um, excuse me. Ginny Stern is a teacher at Sunnyside Environmental School in Portland, Oregon. She teaches students in the first through eighth grades and is, um, has been using biomimicry to work with her students. So I'll now turn the presentation over to Ginny to give us the educator perspective on this fascinating topic. Hi, um, my name is Ginny and I teach at Sunnyside Environmental School. We're a public school in Portland, Oregon, and um, we are a K-8 program. I'm so glad to talk to all of you and I'm excited to um, start working with you so we can um, make our world a better place. One thing we've noticed in an environmental middle school is a lot of times we teach about the environment, environmental issues, We're teaching students to be afraid to be afraid of what's going to happen, to be afraid of limits. And we wonder what would happen instead if we reassure people that there's so much to learn from nature. Nature's our teacher and our guide, and there's a lot of reassurance in the fact that it's, nature spent a lot of time making mistakes and getting things right. Um, so in so doing, and asking nature how to do things in grades, I guess I work most of us first through eighth graders. Um, I've found that students get incredible creative ideas. One of the questions that came in is, how can students start being excited about this? I found that as soon as students started studying about an animal, a uh, migrating goose, or how a tree stands up, everything suddenly seems possible and optimistic. So you might be wondering, how can you use nature as a teacher? The first thing is, go outside. Take a look. Understand that your, te your teacher is standing right in front of you, and all it requires is for you to ask questions and start developing curiosity that comes from just one look. The other thing um, that's interesting to do is once you're outside or even inside your school is to take a look at problems that might uh, exist in your school or in your neighborhood and understand that the form of nature always is related to a solution. The form of nature is always trying to figure out how to deal with a problem. And um, you can take those ideas and put those problems into practice as solutions from nature. Again, Sam mentioned that it doesn't have to be a solution that looks like a mushroom. It can be a solution that looks completely different, but um, it has the same abstract ideas. 
One of the things that um, I have done at my school, I just started messing around with this idea. So when you say, how do I get started? Just, just mess around with it. And I decided that it would be really great to have an invention convention that um, was designing projects to help the environment based on examples given from nature. And when we did this, um, we were sure to not only have the kids as our inventors, but to invent, to invite our neighbors, get community members to come, and that ensured an incredible amount of excitement. When you're doing this kind of thing, it's sort of like doing a science fair. It's an important thing to give students a structure, let them know when things are going to happen, and to give them models that will show you um, exactly what it might look like. We encouraged our students to make um, their displays of recycled materials. And in the front of their project, we wanted them to put a model of the invention that they had that would help the environment and was um, inspired by nature. One of the things that um, I did was I knew students, many students, the our class took a survey and we wanted to study about the bald eagle and how its problems that bald eagle has, obviously, is it has to protect its eyes. And a lot of impact could happen that could hurt a bald eagle. And then once we took a look at those structures, Portland Audubon, we actually got to And we did this as a class. We did it together at first. Another thing we did was we did a lot of scientific experiments about convection currents and how hot air rises and how eagles make use of that in order to save energy so they don't have to flap so much. And then as a class, we tried to how our school best spoke moment in school and how can you apply what we know about um, convection currents to your home to make it a better design. Another thing that I think is super important is to understand that when you have something like this, a fair that invites people to do it a certain way, there's also people who say, I don't want to do it that way. And, and I think we should honor that because nature honors that. There's so many different ways to um, get people involved. So it's important to always provide alternatives to your initial assignment. When a kid says, do I have to do it that way? My answer is, if you can come up with something better, that's awesome. Some of the questions that kids like to do is experiments on, is it really true? Um, is it really true that birds have waterproof feathers? Do an experiment on that and let us know what you found out. The other thing that I think is important and um, seems to jazz my students is the fact that um, it's a, their work is important. A lot of times we tell students that they're going to school to become citizens or to become scientists or to become inventors. I don't believe that. I think if you want to be something, you should start doing it today. And so the students in my classroom are designing things that interest them and concern them. Um, so um, another thing that you might think about is um, here we have a student outside looking at a mushroom and someone said, how do you get started? If you actually start looking at things up close, upside down, inside out, then start having fun with it. This student looked at a mushroom and found that the form of the, mu the mushroom allows for both um, absorption and repelling of water. And he thought, well, if I took the little scales on the mushroom and they could open and shut on a shoe, that would let uh, water in and out as needed. Another thing that you um, can do is provide experiences for discovery. Um, it's important to give students vocabulary so that they can think about form and function. We just took a field trip to Mount Tabor, a, a cinder cone in our neighborhood, and the students, we focused on absorption and repelling. 
of water, and the students use Mount Tabor as their teacher to teach them about how what structures are good for absorbing water and what structures are good for repelling water. And um, they did a lot of discovery. I always give them a bag of materials, scientific materials, to use um, to experiment. I never tell them how to use it, but if you give them eyedroppers and you give them test tubes with water in it, they'll find a way of doing an experiment, uh, experiments about it. The other thing is to stand back and listen to um, what your students have to say. I've found that if I just take out my and start recording them, ask a few questions, level of and articulation about ideas rises greatly. And then in your own classroom, you can create things that not only look at adaptations of animals, but then to ask questions about how you could solve a problem in a human world and give them specific examples about this be used for the homeless or for travel or for clothing. Um, one of the things we did at our invention convention this year is I worked with our social studies folks who had an urban planning unit where kids were trying to solve problems in a contrived urban setting and they had to solve all the environmental solutions for this town. So I teamed up with them and they presented their information at the uh, invention convention and they came up with designs to help their city. They had a brochure that they had to include. Um, one of their solutions for the city had to include a model that was based on nature and they had to explain how that was going to help their city, the student was looking at ivy and the way ivy is made and twirls around to help make you a better turban. Um, this student here was studying, was trying to design a recycling center for um, the city and based it on a cow stomach. And um, I think it's really great when on the same piece of paper they are asked, you know, how does this work? How does the structure help the recycling center or help the um, animal survive and solve its problems. This student was trying to help its city use less energy and made a rooftop that um, in different heating conditions would either absorb or repel the heat. And this roof actually flips over and becomes white when it's trying to cool off. I also worked with elementary kids that were in the great first grade. And our program has an active gardening program. So students were designing tools based on um, animals that like to dig. And students were trying to invent things that would improve um, how long it took to use a clothesline by looking at a hummingbird's iridescence and understanding that light can reflect and did experiments to see if it could actually dry clothes faster. This student decided to, to uh, take the idea of turkey vultures that pee on their legs to cool themselves off and excrete on their legs, pardon me. And um, they uh, had the idea of using water on top of a car through the um, windshield wiper section so in the summertime, you didn't have to use your air conditioning for the car. There's so many different uh, lessons that you can do in your classroom. One of the things I really encourage you to do is to invite all of the different diverse neighbors that you have and have them come and see their great ideas that um, these students have for our city. And to remember to have fun, go outside, um, do experiments, and listen. One thing I thought we could do super fast is um, just take an example of how you could, in the classroom, just get started. So one of the things I did, um, I took an art, I think it was last year, to um, various classes, I took a look at the form and function of an artichoke and then related it to things in the human world. Um, how could you make something that uses tubes to cool off your clothing, for instance? Or um, we know that a sunflower 
moves around, but so do artichokes following the sun. How could you um, use the structure and the form and function of an artichoke, the idea that one side of the cell will act differently than the other uh, to make solar panels um, follow the path of the sun? Students actually dissected the artichoke and took a look at structures of circles that could um, hold a lot of weight. How can that be used in architecture? Or in design, how could people, um, what colors attract who? How can we make people notice what we're doing in advertising? Um, so much beauty is in nature wherever you look. It's important to sometimes just slow down and be amazed. And then think, not only is it beautiful, but it's also how can we combine the two things in our human world to make our aesthetic, sustainable world functional? So what you can do from there, I have from an artichoke. Go home and have dinner and cut up an artichoke and make the make from an artichoke or from a or just something beautiful in your backyard. Who knows when you look at that moon almost full and the clouds circling around it, maybe it'll give you a great idea for some human use that will help our environment. So if anyone has any questions, I'm glad to um, address those. Thank you, Jenny. That was a really inspiring presentation. I loved seeing the students' um, works and their ideas. That was just really, really fun. Um, everyone, please feel free to send your questions to Jenny uh, once again um, via the chat feature to ask a question. And I'll turn it over to Jess if we have any questions from the participants. That was great. Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, I agree with Lillian's comment that that was really inspiring. It was great to see all the students' work and their inventions and what they're coming up with just from observing nature. Um, and she was asking if there were ways that people have found to use this in an educational setting. And I imagine, uh, Lillian, that means sort of tying it into a curriculum that's already in place and trying to make it part of a lesson plan. Um, I'm not sure if that was exactly what she had in mind, but Jenny, maybe you can speak to that a little bit about ways you found uh, to maybe bring biomimicry in and use it in the educational setting, other than just opening it up to kids starting with looking for inspiration. Don't forget the purpose of education is many fold, but one of them is to create a world that's going to be able to continue in a healthy way. So, so many aspects of looking at anything in nature, um, meet all aspects of your curriculum, if you just use your imagine a little bit. So adaptations, form and function, uh, testing over time, how, how does inquiry um, add to the idea of design and technology, and how do we get our ideas from other people? So I guess yeah. what I'm saying is I don't know any way that it does not work with I agree, yeah. It's, a, it's almost overwhelming. There's so many possibilities for ways to use biomimicry. And one thing I'm curious about, if you've uh, run into it, is with so many fascinating looking organisms in nature, is it a problem if students start a biomimetic pro project based purely off of design or mostly off of design without as much of a function or a specific function or use in mind? Well, there's a lot of ways to start. I, you know, if I have a student that's stuck, I'll say, um, what do you love to do? And they might tell me what they love to do. Um, I had a student who could not come up with any idea of what he wanted to do. So I said, what do you love? She said, camels. I said, what else do you love? She said, football. I said, okay, what do they have in common? <laughs> and one <laughs> of the things they have in common is that they both are interested in water. They need water. And he worked with the idea of a camel helping a football helmet before all this discussion about concussions that would have extra support by putting water inside of the football hel helmet and connecting it via the tube. So that's the idea of a camel holding its own water. 
And then when the football player needed water, instead of running to the sidelines, he would bite on his mouth guard, and through the tube it would give him water as well as support for his skull. And that all came from the design of two things that he loved and had a lot in common. That's great. Brilliant. Um, we had a question come in from an educator who, who works with students mainly in a park setting, and she was wondering if you had any projects that were geared or towards a park setting or could be used effectively in a, a natural park setting for about one to two hours. Well, I want to make sure I, I answer this question, so if I don't get to your answer, do a follow-up question. Um, we're working in the park um, where we revisit this park every month. And um, some of the things that we're asking is what does this park have to teach us about design? And then students are going to look at how the park is designed for children, because they're children, and ask questions about um, why do we build playgrounds that are made of plastic in this park? What can this park, how can this park be designed in such a way that it teaches students to play with nature instead of play with plastic structures? Um, and we do that by each month having a different topic, a different form and function topic that they look at and do experiments on, and then um, follow up with design ideas that would help the park. Great. We had a question come in asking, um, what materials do you generally have your students work with? Is it something that they go out and buy from the store, or do they make them in the classroom, or does it matter on the project, or depend on the project? Um, yeah, we just, well, one time what we did was super, and you probably have this in your city too, we have a, um, a place called Scrap in Portland, Oregon, that collects all sorts of materials that people want to get rid of, and then they let us go there and collect them for use for whatever. Some people use them for art materials, whatever. But I went there and got a whole bunch of materials from and my classroom threw them on the table. That was a really good way to do it so that everybody had equal access to materials. And immediately their creativity came out with um, all sorts of insulation pipe and um, um, old clocks and all these different things that they could take the park and make. So that's one way. The other thing is to not undersell the community and partnerships or having an evening when you sit, where you invite people to come and build together. Um, that is a way of making this a family, neighborhood, expansive idea that lets all people all from all diverse backgrounds come in and offer their expertise. So when you do that, when you have partnerships, a lot of people really get excited materials for kids to use. So I really encourage you to do that also. Um, Jenny, we had a question come in asking uh, if you have a good way to tie biomimicry into the Common Core curriculum, um, and do you use lesson plans, or how sort of freeform is it, and how much are, are you able to stick to a lesson plan in the Common Core curriculum using the subject of biomimicry? Well, the idea of the Common Core curriculum is to get at essential skills. Um, the Common Core is one of the things that they're really interested in is can you think scientifically? Can you create things that um, are tested in a way that has meaning? Or are you willing to challenge ideas in a way that is replicable? Um, what I tend to do, this is me, what I tend to do is I tend to invent my own lesson plans. Um, by talking to my students, finding out what they're interested in, and then understanding what is the core idea behind their question. Um, if you dissect a question, you'll find that you can connect it to the common core in so many different ways. Um, if you look at life science, physical science, physical science, physical science, I used to have no interest in physical science. And now when I realize the relationship between 
physics and the natural world. I, like I come out of my seat with excitement. Um, so what I do often is I will do a short little introduction to an idea that relates to either inquiry or um, maybe something about cause and effect. I do an introduction, and then I let students think it with equipment to play with. So the types of equipment that I use for um, the labs are basically household products that you can get anywhere. And I try to keep it simple and down to the essence. Great. <clears throat> I think that answers a lot of the questions we've had coming in. Um, if anyone has anything that they think hasn't been answered fully or if they meant a question in a different way, uh, feel free to resubmit it. But um, I think that's, yeah, I think you guys have done a great job. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. This has been a really interesting um, discussion, and there's lots of really great examples coming through on the chat as well. So I hope everyone's had a chance to, to scroll through that. Thank you again, Jenny. That was a really inspiring presentation, and thank you for taking the time to address our questions. I'd like to take a minute now um, to pass the presentation over to my colleague Gretchen Hooker with um, Biomimicry 3.8. So give me just a moment to um, unmute Gretchen and let her introduce a few resources that they offer for teachers. All right, Gretchen. Uh, go ahead. All right. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you, everyone, on this call. It's so exciting to see so many people in the list here um, participating in this webinar. Um, the Farm Memory 3.8 Institute uh, is a nonprofit, and we facilitate a network called the Biomimicry Education Network, which is um, a resource site and network for educators who, who teach and want to teach biomimicry. So I just wanted to draw your attention to that website, which you can see on the screen. Um, and if we uh, go forward one slide, you can see a screenshot from the home page. Um, uh, the website uh, right now offers a number of curricula and resources that you can use for free in your uh, in your classes. Additionally, there's a blog that we try to keep current with um, news and information and opportunities for educators around biomimicry. Um, and then, additionally, there you know to facilitate networking, peer-to-peer -peer connections between educators. There is also an opportunity to connect with each other and you can search based on geographic location and find other educators near you who are interested in biomimicry. Um, if you go forward one slide, you can see a screenshot from um, the, the map, which shows all those maps and are folks who have registered with the Education Network um, to access our resources and have therefore shared their contact information to connect with with other registered members. Um, uh, and we're really looking to grow this resource. So if you develop um, a curriculum or activity or find a resource that you would like to share with the network, uh, you can submit that to us and we'll try to get it online. Uh, we do have uh, a curriculum in sort of the fundamentals area, which is kind of the basics of biomimicry and things targeted for youth K-12 and university. Um, a couple things I just wanted to mention really quickly. Uh, you, there was a question about chemistry curricula. Um, Sam worked with us on um, a couple of curriculum pieces for youth education around um, chemistry, which are available on our site now. It sounds like he's building that out um, into a much more robust unit. Um, but you can get uh, two labs through the Education Network website currently. And additionally, uh, the case study on Ornolux, the bird safe uh, window glass, um, is also available um, under the, it's actually listed under the university section of the curriculum and resources. Um, and that's a newly posted case study, and we have others available there as well that gives a lot of background information on the research and development of a number of different biomimetic technologies. Um, so I'll, I'll keep it short because I know we're just a little bit over time now, but I just wanted to thank you all for your enthusiasm for biomimicry and hope you can stay in touch. 
Thanks, Gretchen. I just wanted to go back to the slide with the Biomimicry Education Network um, website in case anyone would like to get that down. And thank you to Sam and Jim for your wonderful presentation. Okay, well, once again, thanks everyone. We really appreciate your being here with us tonight um, to hear these wonderful presentations from Sam and Ginny. We really appreciated our presenters spending their time with us. I wanted to share with you a little bit about our upcoming webinars. You can see on the screen our series of webinars um, that will be running January through April as we lead up to Environmental Education Week next April and focusing on engineering a sustainable world. So please come back and join us for another webinar, and you'll be now on our list to receive information about that. Um, one final note before we close for the evening. Um, this webinar will be archived on our website, so if you missed something or were, you know, loved one of the slides or wanted to go back and review, you'll be able to do that at eeweek.org within the next week or so. And I also wanted to note that if you had a question that you think about later, or if you wanted some information about something that was mentioned on the webinar, or if you'd like to get in touch with our presenters and didn't jot down their um, information that they shared on their slides, feel free to send us a note, and that's at eeweek at neefusa.org. I'll say that one more time, eeweek at neefusa.org. Feel free to send us any questions, or if you'd like some more information about something that was referenced, we'll try to get that to you. Thank you again to everyone um, who's presented and helped out with this webinar, and to all of you, our participants, we're really glad you joined us this evening, and hope you have a, a wonderful evening, and we look forward to seeing you on an upcoming webinar very soon.